I'm Greg Jarrett. I'm Shannon Bream. I'm Steve Ducey, and this is the Fox News Rundown. Wednesday, February 1st, 2023. I'm Jessica Rosenthal. Is war with China inevitable? And do we have the resources to respond as we arm Ukraine? Global tensions have some warning and worrying about our readiness. And if you look at the budget uh, for the Pentagon, this year's budget, you'll see that they really are trying to procure a range of capabilities to deal with a range of potential threats. Um, You have to be as ready as possible. I'm Dave Anthony. Is America on a collision course with our debt this summer. Well, when you deal with Congress, you, anything can happen, but Republicans do not want to default. And I'm David Marcus. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. An Air Force commander has recently said we will likely be at war with China in about two years' time. General Michael Minahan said Xi Jinping has secured a third term, has set his war council, and Taiwan's presidential elections are in 2024. The U.S., he says, will be distracted then with our own election, so his gut, he writes, tells him we will fight the following year. The Pentagon Press Secretary, Patrick Ryder, responded by saying, China's a pacing challenge, and the focus is to work with allies to preserve a peaceful and open Indo-Pacific. But the House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Republican Michael McCall told Fox News Sunday he is worried. And it could happen, I think, as long as Biden is in office projecting weakness, as he did with Afghanistan that led to Putin invading uh, Ukraine, uh, that the odds are very high we could see a conflict uh, with China and Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific. The top Democrat on the House Armed Services Committee, Adam Smith, also told Fox News Sunday between talk of war with China and our assistance in Ukraine, he's worried about military readiness, citing a new study from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. What, what industry will tell you is that the reason that they don't have the ability to make as many weapons as we now need is because they don't want to make that major investment without what they refer to as a demand signal, without knowing that we're going to buy them. Uh, U.S. taxpayers don't want to spend a ton of money on weapons that we don't need. We need to increase that ability to surge when we need it. And we've shown no sign of slowing down aid to Ukraine. Before Republicans took over the House, a $45 billion aid package to Ukraine was approved. And since then, we've begun training Ukrainian soldiers on the Patriot missile defense system. President Biden just committed to sending more than 30 tanks to Ukraine. And when it comes to China, this week a report surfaced that the Pentagon was preparing for House Speaker Kevin McCarthy to visit Taiwan. In response, a Chinese foreign ministry official said, we urge certain individuals in the U.S. to earnestly abide by the one China policy. In other words, don't go. We would certainly let the commander speak for himself. I think uh, the Department of Defense is, they believe, and have written it into their defense strategy. That China is their pacing challenge. John Kirby is the National Security Council coordinator for strategic communications at the White House. And if you look at our national security strategy, it also lays bare, quite frankly and clearly, the, the threats and challenges that the PRC pose to our own national security interests here at home and around the world. But it also highlights the fact that we don't want to seek conflict with China. And there's no reason for it this bilateral relationship of ours to devolve into some kind of armed conflict. It is a competition, a strategic competition that President Biden believes the United States is well poised to come out with a strong upper hand. Uh, But there's no reason for this to devolve into conflict. And, you know, Secretary Blinken will will be heading over to Beijing uh, in the not too distant future to carry out uh, one of the taskings that he got from President Biden after President Biden's meeting with President Xi at the G20 in Bali, which is to look for ways to restore, if not revitalize, some of the bilateral vehicles for dialogue and cooperation that the Chinese unfortunately shut down uh, after Speaker Pelosi went and visited uh, Taiwan. One of those is military to military dialogue, military to military communications uh, that now don't exist at that level. Uh, And we want to get them back into place because miscommunication, that's where things can really, you know, uh, lead to potential uh, tensions that never should really arise to that level in the first place. So that's where we're going to stay focused. The top Democrat on armed services, as you know, Adam Smith, he, he said he's concerned given the environment, right? War in Ukraine, which we're supporting with weapons. And this talk now of war with China about military readiness, and there's been a recent study out regarding how ready we may or may not be. And he said specifically the concern is about our industrial base and that even Republicans are are worried alongside him. 
And Smith said specifically on Fox News Sunday, without a demand signal, manufacturers don't want to start making a lot of weapons that we may not buy. If the military has to plan for a number of possibilities, how can they effectively plan in this environment? That's actually been a bit of an eternal task for the Pentagon to plan against multiple scenarios. <laughs> every, uh, every so often, the military will come up with a new national defense strategy or national military strategy. And you'll, if you go back and look at them historically, you'll see that uh, in every one, they talk about making sure the military is poised for any number of different contingencies. Some of it is major state-on-state -state war. Some of it is something a little less than that. You know, in the last 20 years, so much of our focus has been on counterinsurgency warfare in Iraq and Afghanistan, not to mention the threat of, of, of cyber conflict, now the potential threat for space. So if you just look, and if you look at the budget uh, for the Pentagon, this year's budget, you'll see that they really are trying to procure a range of capabilities to deal with a range of potential threats. Um, you have to be as ready as possible. Does that mean you're going to be ready for every single thing that comes up? Perhaps not. But if you cast the net wide and you try to invest in capabilities and resources to better meet them, you know, then you're better poised to adapt as needed. And so we'll, we'll, the Pentagon will be doing that. They will constantly be looking at, again, a, a whole range of, of threats. Democrats and Republicans have said a lot of um, Xi Jinping's calculation regarding Taiwan depends on how the world responds to Ukraine. I think even President Biden has said, you know, he, he says constantly, you know. you know, we're at this crossroads between democracies and autocracies and who will win. Is, is our involvement in Ukraine also part of sending that message? It, it is very much about obviously supporting Ukraine in the fight. But any autocrat, any would-be adversary like Putin you should take notice of what not just the United States has done, uh, you know, in billions of dollars of, of support and security assistance, but that the whole world has done. Over 143 nations at the U.N. voted to condemn Russia's illegal annexation a few months ago, and more than 50 nations, not just from Europe, but from around the world, the Middle East and the Indo-Pacific region, uh, are attending these contact groups that Secretary Austin is having every now and then. He just had one last week in Germany, We're coming together to contribute security assistance, weapons, capabilities, even financing and funding to the Ukrainian armed forces. I think any autocrat uh, should take a long look at how the international community has really rallied and come together under President Biden's leadership to push back on Putin's designs on, on Ukraine. Um, so it is very much about Ukraine. I, I don't want to overstate that. We are trying to make sure that they can defend themselves, their territory, their, restore their internationally recognized uh, borders and boundaries. But, yes, there is clearly a message in here for uh, autocrats around the world. President Biden said the idea that we're going to send in offensive equipment, you know, planes, tanks, American pilots and crews that he said was called World War Three. He said that earlier on in the war uh, with Ukraine and Russia. Obviously, we're sending more than 30 tanks now. So we've moved on on that idea. And a Ukrainian official under President Zelensky is saying now's the time to make the case for aircraft. Do we eventually give aircraft as well? Like where how far do we how far do we go? Well, without getting into future capabilities or announcements that haven't been made, um, what I can tell you is, and the, and the Abrams tanks is a good example of that. We are in constant communication with the Ukrainians nearly daily about their needs on the battlefield, and the tanks are an example of trying to stay ahead of the needs that they're going to have in coming months. Um, and what we believe they're going to need in coming months is a combined arms capability, which is why we and so many other nations are giving them armored vehicles, which include tanks, but are not just about tanks, uh, because they want to be able to maneuver in open terrain fast, quick, efficiently. These vehicles will help them do that. It's also about air defense capabilities. And so as the war has evolved over time, so too have the capabilities that the Ukrainians have needed. And the war evolves uh, because Mr. Putin keeps you know, modifying how he wants to brutalize the Ukrainian people. And we need to be able to evolve with it. And that's the essence of the conversations that we're having with the Ukrainians literally every day. John, just a few more for you. And this is probably sure, an yeah. easy one, I think, to answer. Because as you know, there's a lot of pushback now, especially with Republicans in control of the House. And I see it on social media every day, this concern over how much we spend on Ukraine. I, 
I, I'm just looking for a firm number at this point. I know there's military assistance, humanitarian assistance. There have been drawdowns. There have been congressional spending approvals. How much money have we sent to Ukraine? What is the dollar amount on Ukraine aid? Well, just in security assistance since the beginning of the war, it's about $27 billion. And there are certainly billions in addition to that in terms of financial assistance, humanitarian aid and assistance that have been provided. It has been a substantial investment. And that's the way we look at this. It's an investment. It's an investment in democratic principles and ideals. It's an investment in the future security of Europe. The security landscape in Europe has drastically changed, not is changing, not will change, has changed. The United States now has 100,000 troops on European soil, uh, 20,000 more than we had before Mr. Putin decided to invade. This fight over Ukraine, obviously, first and foremost, it's about we want to stop this war, we want to stop the killing of innocent Ukrainian men, women, and children, and stop the destruction of so many of their towns and villages, but it is about something more. It's about the idea of sovereignty. It's about the very essence of independence. And it's not just the United States who is donating and and contributing to this effort. It really is an international one. Now, yes, we are leading the world in terms of contributions. That is true. And we have enjoyed tremendous bipartisan support for those contributions. There are a few voices on Capitol Hill who are looking askance at this. But by and large, there is tremendous bicameral and bipartisan support for continuing these efforts in but, support of Ukraine. But John, I'm I'm not on, I'm not directly in Capitol here. I'm hearing from just average everyday people who are saying to me and they're not necessarily Republican, but they're they're right. saying, you know, wow, 31 trillion dollars in debt. So how do you address that concern? How do you convince people like we got to keep spending this even though we are in massive debt? That's a great question. And uh, you're right. I was speaking more about the conversations that we're having in Washington. And uh, look, I I get these same questions from my own family, Uh, (laughs) my brothers and my sister and even even my mom, you know, about sort of what is this all about? And the way I put it to them is, yes, it is about the founding ideal of this country, which is independence. That's what Ukraine is fighting for. And I, I think that I think everybody can understand that. But imagine how much more this country and all other allies and partners would have to spend, perhaps not just in treasure, but in blood, if what Mr. Putin is doing to Ukraine is successful. If he gets Mm. to redraw the map of Europe, how much more emboldened will he be? Where will he stop? And how much more effort and how much more time, how much more blood will have to be shed, not just by Ukrainians, but by others, if he is allowed to succeed in this blatant, brutal, and illegal war uh, in Ukraine. Um, We want it to stop now. Believe me, if this war could end today, uh, I think everybody would be happy to see that. Um, And it could end today, quite frankly, if Mr. Putin would do the right thing. That doesn't appear to to be uh, in his playbook. He wants to keep fighting and, and keep killing. So we've got to make sure that Ukraine can keep succeeding on the battlefield so that when it does come to a close, The Ukrainians can be successful at the negotiating table. They can preserve their sovereignty. They can hold on to that independence. And this war won't escalate beyond. It won't stretch and grow uh, and metastasize into something that could be much more costly, not just in terms of dollars, but in terms of human lives. John Kirby, National Security Council Coordinator at the White House, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. This is David Marcus with your Fox News commentary coming up. Will either of them blink? I mean, figuratively, of course. President Biden is supposed to meet today with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in a standoff over the nation's debts. The only person who's being irresponsible that could affect the markets is the president by being that spoiled child said, I will not talk, I will not meet, you know, you just have to raise the debt limit. Republicans have been demanding spending cuts be attached to raising that limit, with McCarthy telling Fox Business. To think that the president believes there's no place in government you can't cut and have a savings for the hardworking taxpayers. There's so much waste out there. The president has said he will not negotiate. On Tuesday, before traveling to New York City, he was asked... Will you negotiate with McCarthy? Show me his budget. Show me his budget. 
Last month, the president said this about House Republicans. You know, they're fiscally demented, I think. They don't, <laughs> they don't quite get it. All of this ahead of the risk that the U.S. could default by June if the debt limit is not increased. Well, when you deal with Congress, you, anything can happen, but Republicans do not want to default. Congressman Jason Smith from Missouri is chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. For weeks now, Speaker McCarthy and House Republicans have been calling on President Biden and Senator Schumer to come to the table to address this fiscal insanity that's going on. And let's figure out where we can get an agreement where you increase the debt limit, but you also address the fiscal insanity. If there's not any kind of negotiation, you're just postponing the next debt crisis. If you look at history, since 1985, in fact, um, eight of the largest fiscal restraints that's been ever been put in order by Congress were all tied to a debt limit increase. Most recent, that was of huge magnitude, was back in 2011 when Joe Biden was vice president under Barack Obama, where they did a CAPS agreement over 10 years that saved trillions of dollars. So what is it specifically that you want attached to an increase in the debt limit? You know, we have one aspect of government. The Republicans control the House of Representatives. Of course, the Democrats control the Senate and Joe Biden's in the White House. Um, We just need something. We need something to deliver for working class families, farmers and small businesses. They are facing the highest spike of goods because of record inflation in 40 years, because of reckless government spending. And they want us to reduce that crazy spending and get our fiscal house in order. So policies that can help move us in that direction, we're not going in there saying we have to have one, two, or three. We're going in saying, let's work together. All right. Your colleague, who used to be chair of the House Ways and Means Committee when Democrats ran the House, Richard Neal, he says that he wants a clean vote, of course. And he says of Republicans, they voted for increased defense spending. Some voted for the infrastructure bill that passed last year. Some voted for the CHIPS Act that passed last year. And the support for Ukraine and all the other things dictate that you have to have a clean vote on the debt ceiling. So he's saying Republicans are part of what you had said was fiscal insanity. I would disagree with him because where the fiscal insanity happened was the two trillion dollar reconciliation bill where not one Republican voted for. That is what spiked the inflation fire. Inflation was one point four percent whenever Joe Biden took the oath of office. Two months later, they passed that two trillion dollar spending bill. And then you led to inflation increasing thirteen point nine percent since Joe Biden's taken the oath of office. And what did people get for that? They got checks to federal prisoners. There was hundreds of billions of dollars of fraud. Hundreds of billions of dollars paid people not to work when we have labor shortages all over the country. It was legislation that bankrupt the economy, but it benefited the wealthy. Their wealthy environmentalist donors got extreme welfare. I mean, there was welfare in that proposal for wealthy corporations and wealthy entities. It's a shame. And then the Inflation Reduction Act, Not one Republican voted for. That's another item as well. So they spent trillions of dollars of their own mandatory spending through these reconciliation packages that not one Republican voted for. So it's not fair for him to say that. Now, Democrats have claimed the Inflation Reduction Act will cut the deficit. I mean, that's what that was one of the arguments they said. Only if you spend $745 billion does Washington Democrats believe that that cuts the deficit. (laughs) Just add up the numbers. I think I think anyone with half of a brain can figure that out. If there is zero negotiation from the president and he sticks by it all the way to June, not doing anything but a clean debt limit, then what? I would hope that President Joe Biden would not want to default on our debt if we gave him a piece of legislation that increased the debt limit that also put our fiscal house in order. I I don't think he would ever veto that bill. I would hope to think he wouldn't. There's talk of Social Security or Medicare could be at risk. Is that true? That that's fear mongering by Joe Biden and the Democrats. 
the Republicans are not tying Social Security or Medicare to the debt limit. I, as the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, we have jurisdiction over Social Security and Medicare. I can tell you right now, we will not be tying it to the debt limit. We are not cutting Social Security or Medicare. This is just scare tactics that this administration is just trying to do. Now, I know the debt limit is just one thing. You have a lot on your agenda. You have a hearing that you have set up to take your committee on the road next week. It is your field hearing, your first one on the state of the American economy. You're going to West Virginia. Let me tell you, this is... I made it a point that the very first hearing that this committee will do will be a field hearing because we want to go to the places where real Americans are. I want real Americans to to come before the committee, tell us their issues, and then give us their ideas of to solve these problems. It seems like in Washington, D.C., it's only the wealthy and well-connected that get up here to lobby. We need to make sure that real Americans have a voice. And so we're going to have field hearings all over this country. West Virginia is Appalachia. It's so similar to my home, which is the Ozarks. Very, very similar. And we have a member from our um, committee, Miss Carol Miller, that's from West Virginia. So I thought it'd be a perfect location. But we're going to be traveling this entire country to hear how small businesses, working class families and farmers are being affected in today's economy and also where they've been affected with prior tax policy, prior trade policy and how they're affected when it comes to health care, affordability and access. It's how we figure out the issues and figure out the solutions from real Americans, not lobbyists in Washington. When you meet people. Are they surprised? I mean, you're, you look at you. You're chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in the House. People would think that you're some sort of a, a bureaucrat from Washington. You talked about being from the Ozarks. I mean, you didn't come up from money. Not even close, no. right? You know, I, I'm a product of the working class. My father was an auto mechanic and a minister, and my mother worked at a factory just so we had health insurance. Um, I live on the same family farm that I purchased when my grandfather died when I was in law school. And guess what? It never had running water. Wow. Um, wow. So I understand what that's like. But so many Americans have those experiences. And the Republican Party is the party of the working class. And as chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, I want to make sure that those priorities are reflective. I want to make sure that our priorities are the working class Americans, small businesses and farmers, not the woke corporations that have shed their American identity to become beholden to China. One issue I know since you oversee taxation on your committee and as chairman, one issue that people bring up is the child tax credit. What is going to happen with that? People got sort of advanced payments on that. Do you want to bring that back? Is, or is there a movement to do that? You know, the Republican Party is the party that started the child tax credit. If you recall back in 2017, when we did the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, we doubled the child tax credit from $1,000 to $2,000, and that expires in 2025. So I believe that we should be able to find some common ground, um, of course. Back during the American Rescue Plan, the Democrats suspended the work requirement on the child tax credit, which created a lot of problems. In fact, if you look at the stats, all of the year 2021, only 1.6 million people returned to the workforce after the work requirement of the child tax credit was eliminated. But when that work requirement came back in effect in the child tax credit at the end of uh, 2021, just in the first two months of January and February alone, 1.7 million people people return to the work. So I think we can find some common ground on the child tax credit, but there has to be a work requirement. And hopefully we can deliver some kind of middle ground. I have to ask you, there's a new congressman from New York and he represents my district, Mike Lawler. You, I don't know if you've met him yet. He's one of the new Republicans in the House and he has a push where he wants to revisit what Republicans did under President Trump with the tax changes, where you limited SALT, the state and local tax deduction. His beef is that it's $10,000 capped for single, $10,000 for couples. He wants to double that to $20,000. Is that reasonable? 
You know, Mike Lawler is a great new member of Congress. He's actually my next door neighbor. Here <laughs> so in you my do know office. him very well. OK. Yeah. His office is right next door to mine in Longworth. So he has already been bending my ear about this. And I can tell you he's a big advocate for the folks in your district because I know New York is a very high tax state. Yeah. You know, I should show I you my ta- my property tax bill in <laughs> my small house. You know, this is a very dicey issue, but I don't believe the tax code should have marriage penalties. And that's an issue that you have within that provision that you just cited. And that's what he's trying to address and fix. So I think there's something that we can all look at it. But like I said, it's a dicey issue. It's brave for Mike Lawler to be bringing it up. And he's definitely working hard for the people that sent him to Washington. You know, people describe you and your role, not just you, but the role you now have as chairman, as one of the most powerful men in all of Congress. How does that feel? I, I don't I don't know about all of that, but it's just it's pretty humbling to have the opportunity when you're just a farm kid from southeast Missouri um, to be able to just serve in Congress, let alone to be chairman of the the best committee in Congress that has jurisdiction over all tax and trade and Social Security. And I just I just want to be able to help make a positive impact for working class families and and farmers and small businesses. A lot of times they're overlooked and they're just considered flyover country by some of the elitist. And and that's not going to happen with me as chairman. House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Jason Smith, a Republican congressman from Missouri, new to that role. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you, sir. And in other news, Meet the American Who recorded the first blues hit and changed music. Mamie Smith was born in 1891 in Cincinnati, Ohio, a crossroads of American musical influences. In New York City in the early 20th century, Smith became a vaudeville performer, singing, dancing, and even performing comedy. Mamie Smith recorded the song Crazy Blues in 1920. She laid down the track with the backing band, her jazz hounds. At 25 West 45th Street in Manhattan on August 10, 1920, Crazy Blues was the first blues hit and became a huge success, selling 75,000 copies in the first month alone. It generated up to a million dollars in revenue for the label, according to various reports. That was a phenomenal figure for the era. In the song Crazy Blues, Smith famously laments, I can't eat bite because the man I love, he don't treat me right. Smith wrapped up the gift of raw American blues in a tidy bow of polished pop professional She was the first artist to share music of the Mississippi Delta with a mainstream audience. Her version of traditional Delta blues was ramped up into rock and roll by American artists like Chuck Berry in the 1950s. Blues reached across the Atlantic and inspired a generation of young British musicians, too, including Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. Mamie Smith enjoyed fame and a career on stage and in film after she recorded Crazy Blues. She died in 1946, but her voice and her work lives on in recorded versions of of her music. Fox News Radio On Demand on the Fox News app. Download the app and just click listen. When you swipe left, you can listen to your favorite Fox News talk shows live. Swipe right for the latest Fox News Radio newscasts on demand. Fox News Radio on the Fox News app. Download it today. Rate and review the Fox News Rundown on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It's time for your Fox News commentary. David Marcus. What's on your mind? New York City Mayor Eric Adams has had it with the migrants. And who can blame him? He and Gotham as a whole have bent over backwards to accommodate the flood of humanity unleashed by President Joe Biden's bumbling border policies. But some of those migrants are now laughing in our faces. Maybe, just maybe, it's time for him to call for some of these malcontents to be deported. This week, we saw full-out protests and the erection of yet another Bidenville tent city outside Midtown's Watson Hotel when ungrateful migrants were set to be moved to a facility at the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal. Mind you, these are some of the people who have been causing mayhem in these hotels, as widely reported throughout the media. Adams is now begging the federal government to help him out as the border crisis crashes into the five boroughs. He means money, of course. But why not ask for real help? Why not ask the federal government to deport those single adult males who refuse to play by our rather generous rules. One has to ask, are these genuine asylum seekers who would do anything to escape the punishing and unlawful conditions of their homeland? Or tourists 
set to give Mayor Adams a poor Yelp review. What exactly is going on here? Since the Biden administration has decided that just about anybody can claim asylum for just about any reason, his honor is stuck providing room service and Xboxes to grown single men. Sadly, that may constitute assimilation in today's broken American society. But why won't Adams demand these people be shown the door? Deportation is the one solution to this problem that Democrats like Adams cannot abide. Oh, they'll evict migrants from Martha's Vineyard to an army base faster than you can say Cesar Chavez, but send them out of the country? That's supposedly inhumane. So where do Adams and his Democrat allies think the migrants should go? Some farm community in Idaho? The Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia? Those locales didn't sign up to be sanctuary cities. New York did. Was that all just talk? As comedian Jerry Seinfeld once pointed out to a rental car clerk, anybody can just take reservations. The important part is holding the reservation. Well, now tens of thousands of people in the country on very questionable grounds are calling in their reservations, and Adams has no answers. There is an answer, and it's obvious. It's the answer any of us would say to an unruly guest in our own home. Take what we are offering or leave. If Mayor Adams is serious about this problem, if he's worried about the actual consequences and not just his political ambitions, then he should be calling for swift and decisive action. The most obvious answer, and frankly, the one most likely demanded by our laws, is to deport those who refuse to accept our system and instead insist we handle their situation on their terms, not ours. The American people, even mostly liberal New Yorkers, are not going to stand for this much longer. We don't get free hotel rooms. We don't get to dictate what our government provides for us. Half the time, we doubt we have any say at all. If Adams wants to lead, he has a chance. If he wants to be a new voice in the Democrat Party, then he can be. He can do it by demanding that Biden deport those migrants who refuse to play by the rules. This shouldn't be particularly controversial. If these young single men are truly escaping oppression, then what New York is offering is a godsend. If not, then it's time to leave. New York needs a leader who can say this and make it happen. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. And now stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. Listen ad-free on Fox News Podcasts Plus on Apple Podcasts. And Prime members can listen to the show ad-free on Amazon Music. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. Listen to the all-new Brett Bear podcast featuring Common Ground, in-depth talks with lawmakers from opposite sides of the aisle, along with all your Brett Bear favorites like his all-star panel and much more. Available now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts.